Intermolecular forces determine the bulk properties of substances. They become especially important for liquids. Recall that liquids exist in that regime where thermal forces are roughly comparable to the intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces aren't dominant for liquids. They're also not negligible. But small adjustments to the size of those forces can push them closer into the negligible side or closer into the dominant side. So they are, are very important in determining the overall behavior of the substance. So we'll examine some qualities that liquids have, which we can attribute to intermolecular forces. First among them is viscosity. This is the thickness of the liquid. So you can think of honey, molasses being thicker than water. And formally, this is how much these liquids resist changing shape when they are sheared between two plates. So imagine, you know, we have this molecule and it's sliding over another molecule. So the London dispersion forces and potentially other forces are going to attract these two molecules to each other and cause them to resist being pulled apart. So those will, forces will be much stronger probably for this large molecule than the small molecule. That's basically going to be the difference between a heavy oil, it's going to have these nice long chain molecules versus a light oil is going to have these much smaller chain molecules. And so the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the viscosity. We could also make the opposing inference. If something has a high viscosity, then we know it must have strong intermolecular forces. There's a very famous experiment involving viscosity called the pitch drop experiment. Pitch is a petroleum byproduct. You use it for waterproofing roofs and boats and making roads. And so the question is, is pitch a liquid or is it a solid? Well, in 1927, Thomas Powell placed some pitch in a funnel and let the experiment run. And since then, eight drops have fallen. The ninth drop has just finished forming. So this is clearly a very viscous liquid, so viscous that it, if you just look at it, you aren't going to see any change. But it's still a liquid because it deforms over time with this application of force. So why is it so viscous? Well, because it has very large molecules in it. Some of them may be on order of having 150 or more carbon atoms in their structure. Here's a, a picture of some of those molecules. So some of them might be in long change. These ones in here you can see have lots of rings associated with them. And so when you have two of these molecules overlapping, you'll have lots and lots of contact area. And so you'll have lots and lots of friction inhibiting their movement, which means it's high viscosity. Another bulk property of liquids, which is attributable to their intermolecular forces is surface tension. This is the tendency of a liquid to minimize its surface area. Consider a water droplet. Why does it tend to form into a sphere by nature? Well, if we look at what's happening inside of the water droplet, the water molecules all attract to each other. So if we have one of these central water molecules, it's being pulled on all sides towards all these other molecules, and those molecules are being pour, pulled towards that molecule. But if you're out in the periphery, out in the edge, then you have molecules which are pulled in by those interior molecules, but there's nothing on the other side, just these you know, rarefied gas molecules, pretty sparsely populated. So since there's nothing pulling outward, then they will tend to move inward. The net effect of that is that you wind up minimizing the surface area because that minimizes the number of these unbalanced molecules if you have a low surface area. And so you, you wind up with a sphere as the, the ideal shape. And so the actual surface tension is measured by the energy which is needed to spread out this surface and flatten this droplet. And this, of course, is going to increase with intermolecular forces. 
So things with very strong forces tend to have very high surface tension and vice versa. Water, because of those hydrogen bonding, has very strong surface tension, especially for a liquid with such a small molecule comprising it. If we wanted to decrease water's surface tension, what we would need is a surfactant. This is a compound that lowers that tension by disrupting the intermolecular forces. So soap can be applied to water, acts as a surfactant. So our soap molecules, parts of them are attracted to the water, parts of them are not. So the parts that are allow them to dissolve into the water. The parts that aren't are not going to have any attractive forces. And so that means that we, we have diminished the total quantity of attraction from all these molecules. I, I've drawn these kind of intermixed, which can happen, but these also tend to sort of form very small little bubbles with all these tails kind of pointing in towards each other. But the, the net effect is that they intersperse between the water molecules and disrupt their attractions. This is also how you would produce bubbles using bubble solution. So they allow you to spread out the water molecules much further so you get that nice huge surface that you need for a bubble. Yet another important bulk property of liquids is the ability to perform capillary action. This is where the liquid flows through a narrow space even against an external force such as gravity. And there are two components to this effect. The first is adhesion. This is where the intermolecular forces attract the liquid to the surface of its container. The second is cohesion, and this is where the intermolecular forces attract the liquid to the part of the liquid that's already adhered to the container. You can see here a comparison of, of two possibilities. The actual capillary effect is where the, for example, water molecules adhere to the glass surface of this pipette and then the remaining water molecules are attracted to those water molecules. So you get this kind of tapering effect. And they generally can't climb all the way up the container because at some point gravity becomes strong enough that the weight of all this water prevents the water from continuing its rise. But it at least makes it up a little bit of the ways. Now conversely, if you have something like mercury, Mercury actually is not attracted to the glass, at least not nearly as much as it's attracted to itself. And so mercury, you'll get kind of this reverse meniscus where you get a bulge instead of a, a depression. And it's trying to do the same thing the water droplets were previously. It's trying to make it so that its molecules are all as close together as possible. Vapor pressure is another bulk property of liquids. And so this is the pressure which exists inside of a closed container because of the presence of a, a solid or liquid. So the solid or liquid is going to evaporate to form the vapor, and then the vapor molecules are going to bounce off the lid of the container, exerting a force, and that's going to be our vapor pressure. It's important that it's closed because if these molecules just escape into the atmosphere, then they're not going to exert the pressure there. And they're certainly not going to exert a constant pressure. Now the vapor pressure is going to increase with the number of molecules that evaporate. If we have twice as many molecules bouncing against the lid of the container, we're going to have twice the pressure. And so if we have strong intermolecular forces, which hold the molecules in the condensed phase, we're going to get less in this gaseous phase, and we're going to have a lower vapor pressure. But at some point, because these molecules can also condense back into the liquid or solid forms, we're eventually going to reach an equilibrium, where the same number of molecules are evaporating as are condensing. And so that's our defined vapor pressure once we reach that equilibrium. Now, something important about this is that it means that vapor pressure does not depend on surface area. So let me show you what I mean by that.
if I were to remove part of this liquid here, I now no longer have these molecules evaporating. So that should decrease my vapor pressure, right? Well, I also no longer have that surface where molecules can condense. So this has an equal effect in reducing the evaporation and reducing the potential for condensation. And the cumulative effect is that it has no change on the number of gas molecules up here. Less evaporate, but less condense. Overall, the number stays the same. Now, if we have a substance that has a very high vapor pressure, because it has a, a high vaporization rate, because it has low intermolecular forces, then that's what's called a volatile substance. Temperature is always going to tend to impact our bulk properties of our substances that are due to intermolecular forces. Remember that these intermolecular forces are in competition with the thermal forces, and especially for liquids, they're roughly comparable. So the temperature might decide which is a more important factor. But with viscosity, surface tension, and cohesion, those are all going to decrease in magnitude when temperature increases, because now the thermal forces are overcoming those intermolecular forces and allowing the molecules to separate. Vapor pressure, by contrast, so that's where the molecules separate from the liquid, and so that's going to be favored by an increase in temperature. So that's going to increase. Now let's consider a couple of cases. Let's consider where we have a, a cold liquid. So our cold liquid, this is a plot of the distribution of molecules of the liquid. The temperature is kind of a report on the average kinetic energy of all the molecules. But the molecules don't each have the same kinetic energy. Some of them have very low kinetic energies and some of them have very high kinetic energies. So this might be a plot for a cool liquid. So you can see that most of the molecules have a kind of middling energy right in here. Some very low, some are very high, just not a whole lot. What about for a hot liquid? A hot liquid, the graph is more spread out. And you have a larger proportion of the molecules in this higher energy regime. Now what's important is that there's some minimum energy required for the molecules to escape from the liquid phase, to break those intermolecular bonds, and enter the gaseous phase. So if we have a hot liquid, that's a much higher proportion of the molecules, which means statistically it's more likely that they're going to escape in the gas phase. So we'll have more gas molecules, and we'll have more molecules striking the lid of our container, which means we'll have more pressure. So heating your liquid results in a higher vapor pressure. We've discussed informally the idea of boiling temperature and its relation to intermolecular forces. Now we're gonna be very formal about it and say that it is specifically the exact temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. But why is that important? Well, if we're going to take this liquid and convert it into a vapor, we can't do it for free. There's a cost. And part of that cost is overcoming the intermolecular forces. The other part of that cost is that we have to push away the existing gas above the liquid to make room for our new vapor. Now, when do we have enough push on the atmosphere to do that? We have that sufficient push when our vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. That's why when you boil a pot of water at 99 degrees Celsius, it's just kind of steaming, but then you get up to 100 degrees Celsius and suddenly you have this huge ebullition because now you have met that threshold where the vapor pressure of the steam matches the vapor pressure of the atmosphere. And what if you're at higher altitude where there's less atmosphere? Well, in that case, your boiling point is going to decrease. It's going to become easier for your liquid to evaporate. Now, in fact, 
if you're in a vacuum, then any liquid is going to evaporate. There's nothing pushing back to make it condense. So it will, every molecule that escapes will just go off into the void of space. So if you have stronger intermolecular forces, you're going to have a higher boiling point because you're going to have more resistance that you have to overcome to enter the gaseous phase. And you're going to have to supply those gas molecules with more energy to give an equivalent pressure. 